first uh, panelist, who's Rav Rahel Mutaya. He's from the he's the communication director at one of my favorite organizations, the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. It's a migrant rights charity that has been at the forefront of challenging policies that lead to discrimination, destitution, and denial of migrant rights for well over 50 years. Uh, Rav, before he was uh, with JCWI, was also uh, involved in lay party campaigns and uh, some um, uh, successful uh, campaigns uh, in the in the Labour Party. And he's won also campaigns from uh, d during his time at Greenpeace and at Small Axe around corporate giants and uh, and and uh, 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 also about engaging people. Rav's background is in international law uh, with a special focus on international human rights law and international refugee law. So he brings a wealth of experience, both the academic, the intellectual, but also the campaigning skills as well. So over to you, Rav. Brilliant. Thank you, Sad. That was a massive introduction, so hopefully I live up to that. Um, so yes, I'm Rabbi Sharm Rahel Mudai. I'm the Communication Director for the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. As I said mentioned, we've been fighting for migrants' rights for over 50 years, providing legal advice, pushing for policy change, and challenging the negative narratives around migration. And today I'm so glad that there's so many people on this call to talk about climate migration. So let's get into that. What is climate migration? What's the link between climate and migrant justice? Well, for me, it's the very real and immediate human element of climate breakdown that clearly shows us how migrant justice is climate justice. So I think it's relevant to start by sharing a story which takes us to Punjab in North India. In the last month, states across North India were hit by heavy monsoon rains, which caused rivers and canals to burst at the seams. It plunged large areas across Punjab into stormy seas overnight. So massive areas of Punjab's agricultural land were submerged and stretches of road were washed away. These floods destroyed houses and infrastructure. They led to the deaths of many and forced thousands from their homes. Sadly, this isn't the first time life-wrecking floods have bulldozed through Punjab, and it likely won't be the last time. And what makes this even more twisted is that Punjabi communities in North India that are most affected had very little to do with the crisis that brought us here. Punjab is a state where 83% of the land is under cultivation and 65% of the people rely directly on agriculture. So for decades, it has been known as India's breadbasket. And Punjabi communities where people live off the land and within their means to feed their families and provide for their community are in fact the model for the sustainable and environmentally friendly future we need. These communities are planet defenders and, th and they were on the front line of the farmers' protest to maintain equitable farming in India. They successfully stopped the Indian government a few years ago from enabling corporations to buy Punjab's farmland and halted the government's continued ecological and biological destruction in its tracks. But they are on the front lines of this climate crisis. And we know that the richest 1% of the world's population cause twice as much carbon dioxide emissions as the world's poorest 50%. But those who have done the least to cause the climate crisis, people in the global south, are most affected. So what are the options for people on the front lines, not just in India, but across the world? While the options for communities facing climate chaos are limited, they can remain and try to rebuild in the hope that destructive weather doesn't return, or they can try to move to a safer, safer place for themselves and their families. So inevitably, climate breakdown is leading to internal and external movement. No one wants to live where the risk of catastrophic, life-endangering extreme weather is an annual occurrence. And we saw images of mass exodus here of British tourists, as I had mentioned, on small boats and any boats they could find fleeing the Greek kind of roads, which has been facing devastating wildfires. So not wanting to live in the face of extreme climate breakdown is a natural human survival instinct. So this is climate migration. This is the movement of people within a country's borders or across borders because they can no longer live a safe or dignified life due to a changing climate. Many people across the world are being affected by climate breakdown and forced into climate migration, from people living in coastal communities whose homes are under threat, to farmers, like I mentioned earlier, who can no longer make a living because of changes in system and farming. And climate migration isn't new, it's been around for a long time, but as the impacts of the climate crisis worsen, it will become a bigger issue for policymakers, campaigners, and activists like ourselves. So I'm glad there's so many of us on this call today because it needs to become a bigger issue for us. And urgently, there is an urgent need for people to have safe routes and pathways to move if and when needed. 
But when they try to move across borders currently to find a safe, to find safety in a better life, they are denied the right to migrate by a brutal and increasingly militarized border regime. So to make matters worse, we're seeing a tightening of borders and a criminalization of those who are forced to move. These policies recently led to the death of up to 700 people in the Mediterranean, which was, you know, there were heartbreaking scenes that we all witnessed. And many who are forced to move are now being punished, criminalized, and even blamed for the consequences of climate chaos, as if it was them who were responsible for these problems, instead of the politicians and billionaires profiting from climate destruction. So who runs these border regimes? Of course, governments across Europe and to an extent across the world use scapegoat tactics which blame people who move as the main cause of society's ills, but they rely on the border surveillance industry to enforce their policies. The border surveillance industry is worth up to £48 billion, with household company names from Airbus to IBM, Amazon and Microsoft profiting from surveilling, arresting and imprisoning people who are seeking a better life and fleeing environments we wouldn't wish on anyone. The same companies that the climate crisis then profit from the violent borders that prevent victims of the crisis reaching safety. In the UK, Serco, Forest, and Clear Springs have made massive profits off the back of this government's hostile environment. But how do we fight back against these border regimes and the hostile government policy? And how do we support people who are forced to move? Well, of course, we know we need to come together like we are today. We need to unite. We need to campaign, we need to push back against the government and their corporate friends. But at JCWI, we've also been using our legal expertise. We've been taking on clients who've come to our country because they are no longer able to live a safe life due to the climate crisis. And we've been winning cases so they can build a new life in our country. And it is the duty of countries in the global north, like ours, to stop burning fossil fuels, to take the climate crisis seriously, but also to welcome those who come to our country so, effectively, we must continue to campaign to stop fossil fuel companies from destroying our planet. We must stop the pollution of our oceans. We must stop the deforestation of the Amazon and then tax on indigenous peoples. But part of our fight and an urgent central part is ensuring that people who move are not further demonized and people have the right to remain and the right to move if they wish. This is a tough time for our movement. We face a government that increasingly employs far-right rhetoric and with the far right waking up to the issues of climate induced migration, now is the time for us to work together to develop positive framing around migration and the climate crisis. We can't be siloed into our own movements if we're to save the planet and save each other, which we can do, and make the world we want, which we can do. It's essential that we come together and work together. So I'm really happy that we're having this discussion today. I hope we can continue to come together like we have today and continue to build this movement and fight for a better world for all. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Rav. Um, our next speaker, uh, Mitzi Janelle Tan, is a very, very dear friend of mine. Uh, she's based in Manila. She's the convener and international spokesperson of Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, as well as Fridays for the Future of the Philippines. I first met her as an organizer with Fridays for Future International and Fridays for Future MAPA, which is the most effective peoples and areas, a really powerful voice on anti-imperialism, anti-colonization, and uh, an advocate for understanding the section of the climate crisis. She was one of the many channel, channel, uh, channeling the voices of the global south, making sure they're both heard, amplified, uh, in those global spaces. Uh, she's always been somebody who's committed to changing the system and building that world that we know that prioritizes people and our planet and not profit, uh, and uh, has been at the forefront of, of recognizing the importance of building collective power. Now, I, as much as I always am, uh, I love having Mitzi on the panel, I do do think it was uh, asking too much to, for her to join us live since it'd be about one or two o'clock in the morning in the Philippines. So we 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 gave her the option of giving us a video, which she is, did, and uh, I think it's about to be played. The fight for climate justice is a fight against colonialism. More and more, we're starting to see people understand this and grasp this concept. We even have institutions like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC 
acknowledging and stating in its latest report that colonialism has been a factor to drive up the vulnerability of communities and countries to the climate crisis. And yet the people in power, they're not hearing this. In fact, they're intentionally blocking this information from themselves and from the rest of the world because they know that once people connect the dots between climate change and colonialism, that they're in trouble because they are the colonizers. And so even though we're starting to see more and more people understand and say and grasp this concept, I feel like there's still so much for us to learn and understand about what it actually looks like, what it truly means. My country, the Philippines, is one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world to the climate crisis. We've had the highest number of extreme weather events in the past 20 years globally, according to the latest studies. We have an average of 20 super typhoons every year. And this means that our country has a collective trauma from seeing entire communities consumed by floods. It means that people have grown up being afraid of the next typhoon tearing down their house and their rooftop that children have been afraid of drowning in their own bedrooms, that people have been stranded on rooftops for days without anyone to rescue them. We have these extreme weather events. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is how we're not able to adapt, how we're not able to bounce back, how we're not able to become structurally resilient and how there's no systemic support where did this come from? That's where the crisis nature of the climate crisis comes from. It's not just the extreme weather events, it's also how colonialism persists until today. The impacts of it are still happening today. It means that because of the ongoing historic exploitation of our land and of our people, we're not able to adapt. The Philippines supposedly gained its independence in 1946, that was 77 years ago. That we were colonized by Spain for around 300 years, and then Japan, and then the US. And then the US set up our government. And that's why I say supposedly, because so much of our economy, our politics, our culture is still heavily dictated by global North countries, especially the US. And while our government structure has changed since what they set up, a lot of it is still influenced by the US and that initial setup. And the government that we have today is one that is corrupt, one that is ruled by the richest and the richest in the Philippines and only rule for their profit and for their gain. And our policies are set up in a way that our resources here are still being extracted for cheap for countries like the US and the global north. And when I've talked about this in the past, I've been asked, how does this relate to the climate crisis, Mitzi? Why are you talking about this? It's not about the environment, but that's the reason why we're not able to adapt is because we haven't been able to industrialize. And so we can't even make the We can't even make the tip of this pen because we don't have the machines to make them. Although we have all the resources and the materials, but they are being exported for cheap to countries in the global north. Um, so we remain dependent on them. And so we're not able to create our own things. We're not able to become structurally resilient. We don't have evacuation centers that are built to be evacuation centers because there's no proper city planning because the people in power don't care about that because the people in power only care about making the global north happy because so much of our economy is dependent on the global north because of the world system today that started from colonialism. We're seeing that our agricultural practices in the Philippines is an agricultural country. It was set up in the Spanish colonial times. We have a hacienda, hacienda system where um, landlords own large plots of land and those monocrop plantations, they produce cash crops that are then exported to the global north. And so our food security is threatened, not just by the exacerbating climate crisis, but by the system of our agriculture itself. That means we have small farmers who 
are so vulnerable to the climate crisis and as they fight for their land and their right to land, they're threatened and killed by our military and called terrorists. So that lack of infrastructure development, the, the unsustainable agricultural practices, the resource extraction and the way our land is being used, this was all because of colonialism and it is being exacerbated by the climate crisis, which also was caused by colonialism. That means that our country also has one of the highest numbers of internal displacement and internal migration because of the climate crisis. Because especially the rural areas are not being developed and not given support and so they flock to the city and that makes them even more vulnerable to factors here in the city that because the city is also does not have enough opportunities and jobs for people. And how does this relate to the climate crisis? This means that we have people who are vulnerable, people who are economically marginalized. Um, we have a growing number of urban poor and people who are homeless. And so when there are floods, when there are um, uh, health crises caused by the climate crisis, like dengue and malaria, who's heavily hit? It is the people who are most economically marginalized. It is the people who are most affected by all the other socioeconomic injustices already. We also have a large number of diaspora and overseas workers, and these Filipinos abroad also become part of the people who are most vulnerable to the climate crisis in the global north. So when we're talking about the climate crisis, we have to talk about adaptation, we have to talk about reparations, and part of that is the right to stay. That means being able to develop our country and our community, putting research into what's actually needed per community because we don't even know what adaptation looks like in the Philippines, not really, not truly. We'll, we'll have some things like, oh, plant these things, plant mangroves, early warning systems, but what does it look like per community because we have such a diverse um, landscape that it needs so much prioritization that's not happening because we don't have the resources for it or because the people in power are also not putting resources into that, but instead putting resources into our military, which is protecting the foreign um, companies that are extracting our mines and, and our land. And then there's the question of having the right to move, the right of safe passage. The idea of climate refugees isn't even, uh, doesn't even have an official definition. Um, and so that means their rights are not recognized. And so as the climate crisis exacerbates, will more and more people be kicked out? These are the questions that we have to answer as a climate movement. We have to remember that because the climate crisis exacerbates and amplifies all socioeconomic injustices, it is the climate movement's duty to amplify and intensify all social justice movements because there is quite literally no climate justice without racial and migrant justice. We have to make sure that people have safe passage, whether it is because of climate or political reasons, because all of them, they're all caused by the same thing, the system that prioritizes profit over people and planet, the system that only cares about the greed of the richest because it is the system that they set up and that they maintain. And so it's time for us to take back that power. And when we're thinking about it, we have to remember where do the imperialists take their power from? Where, what are they doing that's making the climate crisis worse? They're extracting from the earth. They're extracting from the planet. They are taking our land. And so the fight for climate justice is the fight for land. It's the fight for air, it's the fight for water, it's the fight for life. And this is a fight that I don't intend on losing. And this is a fight that I know that we can win because there's so many of us across the world fighting for the same thing, it's impossible to lose. I muted myself. Uh, uh, as powerful ever, as ever, Mitzi. And in fact, our next uh, panelist, uh, both of her and Mitzi, are youth activists who came from youth movements that really brought a new energy and 
and really reimagined the politics of intersectionality that builds on the work of so many of our movements have done. Uh, I'm really pleased that we have Michaela Loach, who's a great organiser, uh, who writes, uh, focuses on these intersections of the climate crisis and how they intertwine with inter oppressive systems, and also about how we make our climate movement a much more accessible space. Uh, I'm sure you've picked up her book. She's like an amazing author of the Not That Radical, The Climate Action to Transform Our World, but uh, also comes with a, uh, was a former medical student and has got a degree in global health policy. Um, and uh, so often I think in our, in our struggles, we, 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 we know we have many fights to fight, we don't celebrate the victories that we do have. And it was great back in 2021, um, the Stop Campbell oil field campaign, which Michaela was part of that very successful campaign, and also was one of the three claimants on the paid to pollute case, which took the UK government to court over the huge amounts of public subsidies that were being handed over to fossil fuel campaigners every year. Um, Really pleased Michaela is here with us. I know she's not been well and she's just literally just uh, uh, agreed to pop on to, to, to contribute. So thank you again, Michaela, for making the time. And now over to you. No, thank you so much for having me. Yes, sorry, everyone. Um, I am not going to be on top form, but I'm really grateful to be here. And thank you all, everyone, for being here. I'm just, just in a fair bit of pain, but it's all right. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get through this. Um, not get through it, we're going to enjoy it because it's important. And this is a very, very important topic. So thank you all um, yeah, so much for taking your time out on a Thursday evening to come and listen um, to all these incredible speakers who I feel incredibly humbled to be um, put along with in this and I'm going to be talking a bit about climate justice and I thought I would start um with how I got into this movement because for my for me getting into the climate movement was actually through a lens of migrant justice so I was born in Jamaica um a small island in the Caribbean that despite our like very small size has had a very big impact on the world and so people do actually know where it is um and moved to the UK when I was about two and a half years old three years old and growing up in the UK, um, as a black woman, as a black person in the UK, um, I experienced obviously a lot of racism um, in lots of different ways, a lot of interpersonal racism in particular, um, and structural more as I got older. Um, but it, but I could see that this world is not the best as it could be. Um, and then I remember very clearly um, the moment that I, I kind of got radicalised, I guess, was um, a moment that many people will probably remember, a really harrowing moment, so um, just, I guess, true warning for... Um, the, I'm going to be talking a bit about Alan Kurdi um, and the photograph of um, a three-year-old Syrian boy's body washed up on a beach in Greece. Um, and I remember seeing that photo and thinking about the fact that when I was around the same age, I was able to move to the UK safely and easily and legally just because of the privilege of having a British father and a white British father in particular. And that that same privilege and, and luck of, of, of birth and of position was not offered or not allowed for Alan or his family. And I just really could not let go of that feeling that um, if, yeah, if it had been a different island that I was born on, if it had been a different circumstance I was born into, um, it could have been me and my family in that in that situation. And the unfairness of it um, really hit me whilst I was um, a teenager and so got involved with migrant justice organising in Calais in particular, um, just doing very material things of, of chopping wood and baking things and cooking food for people. Um, and that that really first showed me that to, to be an activist or to do activism is just to be active in the face of an issue that you see. Um, but also that really illuminated to me um, for like, yeah, um, how much um, the kind of legacy of and the persistent legacy of colonialism um, is the reason why so many people are um, are displaced in the first place and therefore that there's a huge responsibility that we have as people who who live in the core of the empire and um, to have an impact on that not only the policies on our border but also the policies that have put people in those situations in the first place and addressing addressing that harm um and so if i yeah so i wasn't really into climate at that point because i think like many people um who are racialized and um, as or racialized as, as as black in particular um i felt like there were more pressing issues in particular that migrant justice is a more pressing issue than the climate crisis and I still at that point saw them as, as quite separate um that police brutality is a more pressing issue that um that there are that poverty is a more pressing issue for my community in particular um and I felt like the climate crisis was just for like to be honest middle class white people who had nothing better to worry about and it was only actually um when I was 
on in Calais and, and having conversations with people um, who were displaced and realizing how many of their situations not just was because of colonialism but also because of the climate crisis and realizing that the climate crisis is just going to make insecurity for people globally even even worse and, and realizing about the, um, climate justice in particular and its legacy of colonialism that these that it's not the great equalizer that we're told it is it's actually the great multipliers as Mitzi spoke on so brilliantly and that it multiplies the existing ways people are oppressed that I became passionate about the climate crisis um, and tackling it um, and realized um, that it is a, a very pressing and important issue today and for communities today as well as, and it's not just this kind of existential threat of the future. Um, and also in, um, I went back to Jamaica um, to see my family and a beach that I grew up going to, um, Helsha Beach, I don't know if anyone's, there's always Jamaicans in any event that I've ever done because um, we are everywhere, um, but people will probably know about Helsha Beach. And I kind of grew up going to that beach very frequently. Um, and then going back to Jamaica, um, and visiting my grandmother and going back to that beach, um, I saw that it's almost completely disappeared. And I actually moved back to Jamaica last year and, um, and spent a bit of time in Hellshire. Um, and my grandmother lives about 10 minutes drive from that beach. Um, so many communities live in that area, much more proximal. And if, if that beach is already disappeared now, if when I drove around the island in Jamaica, um, you can see the water levels of where flooding is hit, especially on the coastal communities. Um, those Im impacts are already happening now. What's it going to be like in in ten or twenty years if we don't if we don't take adequate action? And important thing if we don't take adequate action because action is happening, but in in the wrong way often on climate. Um, so yeah, climate justice is the great equalizer. It's not the great equalizer. It's the great multiplier. So for example, humans in poorer countries are around five times more likely than those in richer countries to be displaced by sudden extreme weather disasters. And even in that, we need to interrogate why our country's poor or rich in the first place. Like, what do we mean by those markers? And Michael Prenti um, says that countries are not poor, they are overexploited. And I would say that countries in, the, in that sense are not rich, they overexploit. And so there's a relationship there. Um, so it's not just because of geography that certain countries are made, are made more vulnerable. It's also because of these historical um, relationships between the global north and global south. So whilst we might be in the same storm, um, we are not in the same boat. Um, some of us are in like giant ocean liners that have been funded by colonial wealth and then others have been forced into unseaworthy rafts who've had their resources stripped away from them in order to build these huge colonial liners that, um, that protect others. And that relationship is really important for us to, for us to understand um, in both the creation of the climate crisis and the impacts that are being felt today. So climate justice demands that we interrogate the foundations of this world um, that created the climate crisis in the first place, these foundations of, of whiteness, which is a, a power system. It's not just that um, we talk about environmental racism, which I'll talk about a bit later. I think people sometimes think that, um, also, sorry, very kind that people are saying nice things in the chat. I'm, I'm going to try and focus though. But um, it, I think sometimes people think that when we talk about these power systems that it's, oh, well, you know, the climate doesn't care about what someone looks like or what their features are or their heritage. Um, but it's not that pollution is, is following people because it doesn't like them. It's because it's about power systems and that prioritise some lives and deprioritise others and therefore put some lives in, in deliberately into precarity and vulnerability um, and protect other lives. Um, and so, for example, I've talked about the global north and global south a little bit, and I would, I would love to touch on that more. But I'm going to use some UK examples um, even within the UK. So there's obviously this like this in the different impacts of where countries are geographically in global north and global south but even within countries like the uk and the global north um how people are like positioned in in our hierarchies under whiteness and, and capitalism um people experience oppression differently um and therefore they impact are impacted by the climate crisis differently um so for example black communities in the uk are particularly more likely to be um situated next to incinerators and next to dangerously high levels of air pollution um for example the example that i use um in my book is about um edmonton because my the jamaican side of my family who came over to the U. so my grandma stayed in jamaica but the part her brothers that came to the uk um in the 70s um, they moved to an area called Edmonton that a lot of people obviously know in, in London. And in that area in London, it has 65% of the population are people of colour. It's also one of the most deprived areas um, of the UK. Um, and it also is the, the, the site of the largest incinerator, waste incinerator in the UK, the Edmonton Eco Park Incinerator. Um, 
And it's not just Edmonton where incinerators that cause dangerous levels of air pollution are situated. And um, this trend is seen across the UK. And it's also, again, it's not just um, in this situation, it's not just um, race, it's also about class and also about um, yeah, what communities are seen as are seen as or situated as more disposable and allowed for these kind of harmful um infrastructure to be, to be put next to them. So whilst so it's a it's in the global north as, as well as as well as globally. Um, but that might all seem really serious and, and scary and, and sad. And, and I think I'll talk a bit about fear in a moment. Um, but what, what, what got me into the climate movement um, and didn't take me away from the migrant justice movement, but more like incorporated climate into the work that I was already doing to try and um, tackle systems of oppression. It wasn't just the fear. It wasn't just the amplification of, of oppression. It wasn't just the amplification of, of inequality. It was this realization that as the climate crisis has has come from these same systems that have caused um, harm to different people over and currently, materially and also historically, um, then to tackle it adequately, we also have to tackle these same systems. And therefore, in that way, climate justice gets to be a portal into a better world, a portal into a new world, an opportunity to transform everything, an opportunity to really tackle these issues finally. So by tackling the root, these root causes of whiteness, capitalism, colonialism, we can create a more equitable and transformed world for all of us. And we have to remember that the elite class don't want us to do this. Um, they want to distract us and divide us. They want us to demonize people who have the same interests as us in, in creating this better world. They want us to focus on those who are already marginalized rather, rather than realizing that it's those who have a huge amount of power that have caused this crisis. And they're scared of our power when we come together. They're scared of us recognizing these connections that we have that between migrant justice and climate justice in particular. Um, and we always have to ask when we're seeing communities being demonized in the news or, or anywhere, or even within our groups, when we, when we hear people say that to talk about um, issues of justice is diluting the movement or diluting the message. We have to ask it, who does this serve? Who does that narrative? Um, that these issues are too much or too distracting or too complicated. Like who is benefiting from that narrative? And I think that who's benefiting from that is the elite class. And I'd ask you at any moment, always ask like, who does this serve? And we have to also remember um, that all climate action is not climate justice. It is very possible for us to take climate action that makes a more unequal world. That that's um, a kind of so that would be called eco-fascism in particular. So it's very possible for us to take climate action that increases austerity, that causes more harm to people who are already experiencing a huge amount of oppression, already being forced to, to live with less. That is very possible. And also it's important to recognize that um, climate action is going to happen at some point. Um, and so what the climate movement's role needs to be is, is not only when that happens, but how it happens and, and, and what world are we going to be um, creating? What is that world that comes next going to look like? Are we going to go down the route of eco-fascism in which um, PEF people have caused more harm? Or are we going to take this portal into a new world in which all of us get to live in dignity, all of us get to be safe, and we actually can address these inequalities and these oppressions? And I think that we climate justice requires us to come together and demand more, knowing that not only we can create this better world and this, this transformed world, um, but that we must because the alternative of this of ecofascism is, is so deeply terrible that we have to turn away from it. Um, and we also have to realize that to to incorporate the reality of this world, to realize that there is no single issue struggle because we don't live single issue lives, as, as the great Audre Lord said. Um, is not to make our movements weaker, but to make them stronger. It is, it is for us to actually be finally tackling the real roots of, 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 this, of this crisis, um, rather than um, just putting a Band-Aid on an, on an issue whilst the rot is still there. We need to treat that kind of internal rot in the same way as yeah, I was a former medical student. Um, when someone come, if someone came in and was and had heart pain or chest pain, not heart pain, they wouldn't say heart pain, they had chest pain and I gave them a painkiller, um, but didn't treat any of that heart disease that's causing that in the first place. They're going to keep coming in with more manifestations of that disease. That same thing can happen with our world. If we take climate action that just addresses emissions, it's like giving a, um, a painkiller to someone with heart disease. What we need to actually do is treat the disease in our world, which is whiteness and capitalism and imperialism and colonialism. Um, and to do that makes our movement stronger, not weaker. And to do that creates a world where all of us um, are safe and live in dignity. Um, and I think to do that is also to create a movement that is exciting for people to join. Um, and also to do that does not have to, we need to, our role as well is to communicate that as not being outrageous or ridiculous or 
too radical as some people would frame it. But as the common sense that it is, the common sense that that all of us want to be safe, the common sense that these this crisis did come from these issues, and therefore to tackle it adequately, we have to tackle these issues too. Um, and thank you so much. I was going to talk about fear a bit, but I don't want to take up anyone else's time. But um, thank you for bearing with my um, pain self. But um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of this event. Thank you, Michaela, and uh, really appreciate. I, I know you're not well and making the time. So if you have to jump off, uh, that's really understood. But uh, we are really delighted that you have made the time. And uh, as ever, uh, lots of welcome words of wisdom um, and a political analysis, I think, uh, you can uh, see in the chat. Uh, uh, lots and lots of love being sent over to you. So lots of love to you, Michaela. Um, uh, as uh, I, In fact, as Michaela was uh, touched on, climate change is shaped by and continues, of course, to shape our global and socioeconomics, the psychological harm and the security of our communities. And our next speaker is Noura Firak, and she actually has the lived experience, having grown up on the front lines of climate change in the Maldives, one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world, uh, partly due to its uh, 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 low-lying geography. Um, Noura is the Deputy Chief Executive uh, Officer at Climate Outreach, which is an organisation that works to widen and deepen public engagement on climate change. So I'm really looking forward to hearing her speak and hopefully uh, about unpacking these challenges of engaging the public on this broader narrative that we've heard from uh, Mitzi, Michaela and Ravi. So over to you, Nura. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all the speakers. It's really inspiring to hear from everybody and the, and the speakers we've heard today as well. Um, so hello, my name is Nora. Um, is, as I said, I'm Deputy CEO of Climate Outreach. Our work in climate change and migration began in 2007. We created the Climate and Migration Coalition in 2011 to bring uh, together civil society organizations to work together on the issue and provide a platform for shared learning and advocacy. We are a member of the advisory board of the uh, we are a member of the advisory board of the platform on disaster replacement, the key global negotiating spaces um, for states to agree on solutions to climate linked displacement. We provide training and learning um, for civil society organizations wishing to gain a deeper understanding of these complex issues. Um, yes, I grew up in the Maldives. My loved ones still live there and I go home regularly and it's still very much my home. My home is a very low line nation. Um, we have mostly water, 1% is land. Sea level is rising. We are very vulnerable to climate change. Since I was a very uh, little girl, um, I've been hearing narratives such as people will simply have to leave the Maldives and become a climate refugee. And it actually used to make me very depressed and uh, give, gave me a lot of anxiety when I was young. And when I was a child, I honestly believed that one day I might have to leave Maldives as well. And but without having any idea of where I would go and um, imagining quite a catastrophic situation. So the connections between but I would say the connections between climate change and immigration are complex. Um, it's not just a simple case of uh, relocating people from one country to another, it's far more complex. During my lifetime, I have seen how Maldives has adapted, but we are also very tired of adapting. Half of our national income goes to climate mitigation and adaptation. That is a lot. We are a small state, but spending half of a budget on adaptation and mitigation is significant. I've also witnessed how climate-linked migration happens, witnessed its complexity and interconnectedness with issues such as economy, education, security, health and safety. Climate change changes a nation's psychology, security and the social fabric. At Climate Outreach, we do research to help help to build helpful narratives that will progress the calls for action, um, especially the calls for actions that we've been hearing today by all the speakers. So we believe that the terminology we use and the language is very important. We tend to differentiate the following two, climate-linked displacement and climate-linked migration. So at Climate Outreach, we say climate-linked displacement is to describe situations of extreme forced movement 
following earthquakes, tsunamis, um, and or tsunamis or such sudden extreme events, typhoons as well. We use climate linked migration to describe many types of movement, but not situations of extreme forced displacement. Climate linked migration is where when people move due to climate related reasons or have climate related dimensions behind their motivations. We're talking about instances where people are moving for reasons such as food scarcity due to droughts, failing crops. Um, we've heard um, quite a few stories from our speakers today about the, the sort of, you know, the impact of climate change in their communities. Um, drought, for example, how droughts can cripple economies. So people may need to move to find work because they lost their economic livelihood due to droughts, or they need to move because of the impact of the climate change on their health means that they need to move to a city where there is better access and easy access to healthcare. So climate change never acts alone. There are many forces that play into it um, because that's how climate change affects our life. In, in Maldives, as our fish stocks declined, fishing became challenging and, and became, an, became as an occupation with high entries, uh, with high barriers to enter. So as the country transitioned from a fishing economy to a tourism economy, people migrated temporarily to work on resorts. Globally, we know that climate change will reshape patterns of movement. But we don't have reliable figures about how many people will move or when but we do know most climate linked migration is internal. People move without crossing international borders. A lot of climate linked migration is seasonal and circular. People move regularly between multiple locations to cope with climate impacts. I'm not saying by any means people don't cross international borders, but as it is today, most of the climate linked migration happens quite circular, seasonal and within locality. So migrants are within locality. Yeah, just gathering my thought. So migrants and refugees are often used as objects of fear in the debate about climate change and migration. The future of climate mobility may not be what we see in the media. Climate change is often used to create a new immigration scare story. Existing tropes about migration are packaged into stories of climate change. So we do need to shift the discourse and conversation on climate change. We need stories and narratives about climate linked migration that break away from these problematic narratives. We need the new narratives to be accurate, center the experiences of people on the move, avoid language of fear and create room for conversation about solutions. We do need to tell personal stories of people with lived experience of climate linked migration because these stories are complex and varied. Adaptation is important, but we also know that we also cannot hope that adaptation will mean that people don't need to move. Adaptation has its limits too. The UK may not be a major receiving country for people moving due to impacts of climate change because of our geographical location compared to other countries in South Asia or in Africa, African continent. At the moment, most movement is internal and short distance. However, in the UK, in the, however, in future in the UK, we may see more people arriving who have a climate, climate change dimension to their movement. The UK could look to expand its emergency humanitarian visa program. This would allow people who are in the UK already to extend their stay or make it permanent if their country of origin was badly impacted by climate change. The UK could also explore ways of using aid and development budget to help finance relocation and migration as adaptation projects, especially when there is a legacy of colonialism and injustices in climate change. Mitzi and other speakers have spoken beautifully and eloquently about it, so I'm not gonna repeat that, especially to those countries where climate-linked migration is already happening and is relying on it as a form of adaptation because their journeys are not always safe, legal, and they, don't, they, and they do sacrifice quite a lot. And those countries have limited resources. For example, quite often people leave their families behind and seasonally migrate to cities 
um, to cities or in the case of Maldives to resorts for work. Families are growing apart in hardship. We know that impact of that will be enormous as the social fabric of communities are broken. But we can solve these issues by supporting climate linked migration as a form of adaptation through aid and development money by investing in creating safe living environments for families together. So we must explore migration as a form of climate change adaptation, but people so that we can make their journey safe. The UK could also expand its work and study visas in places that will be badly impacted by climate change. But to me, it doesn't make sense to create a new climate refugee convention because it's difficult to isolate a group, uh, a group of people moving only because of climate change because it has because it 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 doesn't move alone. Increasingly, people will be moving for multiple complex reasons. Therefore, it's important. It's better to create policies that allow people to move regardless of their driving force behind their migration, and support those countries where climate-linked migration is already happening and will happen and are using as a coping mechanism to make their journeys legal and safe. On that note, I will uh, stop and I hope to explore more through Q&A. Thank you. You're on mute, Asad. Sorry. I don't know how I'd mute myself then. Uh, I was just saying thank you, Noor, uh, and, 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 and really important that we recognise the realities that the majority of displacement takes place within and across the global south, but also the importance, of course, of the need for safe routes and the complexity of when we talk about climate displacement, climate induce migration, climate linked migration, that it goes back to very much as uh, what Michaela and, uh, and, and Mitzi and others were saying, it's about you have to take a holistic view of like what are the drivers of this disease and not just its symptoms. Um, uh, but now moving a little bit of a tact, uh, I, I, I know my next speaker may not want me to say this, but I will anyway. Um, there's been, of course, whilst it's really welcome that many in the climate movement are beginning to make the connections between climate and racism and the hostile environment of the state. It has been the work of many tireless climate activists and anti-racist activists over many years who have brought us to this movement. And uh, I just want to recognise that way back in 2017, climate and justice activists, you know, stopped a deportation flight with their bodies uh, and they became known as the Stance of 15 and, and of course, then faced the full force of the state um, and one of those uh, was our next speaker, which, uh, who is uh, Melanie Strickland. Uh, she is uh, a, a tireless campaigner and she now campaigns with Lawyers Are Responsible, which is a group of lawyers who are targeting the fossil fuel industry enablers in the legal sector and have continued to support activists who exercise their right to peaceful protest, particularly those in solidarity with us on the front lines of the climate crisis. Really delighted to have you join us, Mel. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Asad, for that lovely introduction. Um, I also wanted to say that I also um, organise with Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers, um, who I know that have done a lot to kind of promote promote this event. So I wanted to mention them too. Um, so I wanted to speak um, a bit about um, my friend Marcus Decker, um, a climate defender who's in prison at the moment uh, for uh, scaling the QE2 bridge in, in um, Dartford and hanging a, a Just Stop Oil banner. Um, so he got a sentence of two years, seven months. Um, he had the sentencing appeal yesterday, him and, and um, uh, Morgan, who is also uh, one of the climate defenders doing that action. Um, because because his sentence was over 12 months um, and he's a, a German citizen, he's liable for automatic deportation. And the Home Office have already written to him and, and told him of his intention, of, of their intention to deport him. So um, Marcus is, is my friend. Um, we, we met through climate activism in 2020. He's been here for three years. Uh, he has a partner, he has a family. Um, he lives locally in, in Tottenham. 
What's happening to Marcus, I see uh, as a form of hostile environment oppression. The hostile environment is hostile to all of us, uh, not just migrants. Um, solidarity is criminalized also. Um, I just wanted to read out uh, a lovely quote that uh, Marcus, ga Marcus gave to LBC Radio whilst he was in prison in April 23. He said, I would rather be in prison for two years and seven months than know about all the children and the people who are dying around the world and not do anything about it. I love that spirit. And, and also I wanted to read a short quote from Angela Davis, who's um, like always uh, gives me spiritual sustenance, an amazing uh, black activist. And, and th these are her words when she was in prison in 1971. The offense of the political prisoner is his political boldness, his persistent challenging, legally or extra legally, of fundamental social wrongs fostered and reinforced by the state. He has opposed unjust laws and exploitative racist social conditions in general, with the ultimate aim of transforming these laws and this society into an order harmonious with the material and spiritual needs and interests of the vast majority of its members. So we need to challenge deportations. Um, we need to challenge uh, deportations being used as a repression tool against activists. And we also need to challenge deportations in general. Borders are part of a process of exploitation and displacement. Uh, the climate crisis is a racial, um, is, a, is, a, is a racist crisis and black and brown and indigenous um, bodies feel the worst effects of, of, of this violence. Surveillance of climate activists, once they come out of prison or um, whilst they're awaiting um, prison, has been widely tested and implemented on migrants, um, in the form of GPS tagging and biometrics. We need to develop a, a secure foundation from which to challenge injustice. We're not strong if we're not diverse. We need to be fighting alongside the people who are on the front line of climate catastrophe and ecological collapse. That includes migrants, that includes marginalized people everywhere. Oppressions are connected and the different forms um, of, the, of the oppressions have common roots, as other speakers have spoken about. The roots include capitalism, racism, and colonialism. And so I'll, I'll just end on this to, to allow time for, for, for questions. Um, the climate movement must continue to develop a broader analysis of the intersection between climate justice and, and migrant justice um, so that we can have a strong, resilient and, in, and vibrant movement that, that is diverse. Uh, and so we can, we can successfully challenge the, the broadening hostile environment, but also fight for a better world, a better future, um, and a post-climate breakdown. I'll end it there. Thank you so much, Mel, and uh, absolutely, we have to fight against the expanding hostile environment, and of course, uh, and stand with uh, Marcus and all those facing deportation, and as we know, and we can see it in front, we've whether it's the failed Rwandan plan, the small boats bill, the prison ships that have been built, the UK pulling back from its obligation and the Re Refugee Convention. It's a full on assault. Um, but within that, of course, migrants are not passive and they're organising. It's a rich history of organising. It goes back, back to the 1900s with the Aliens Act. It was uh, the 1960s and 70s with the virginity tests um, and the uh, anti-deportation campaigns of the 1980s. And, uh, and of course, uh, as we often say, the front lines of the world, well, those front lines are also here. And so I'm really delighted 
about to have our next speaker, who's Tandri Tandrima Muza Muzamdar, who's of Indian heritage, uh, Mancunian by choice and a sanctuary seeker by circumstances. She organizes with many different migrant justice organizations, including Women Asylum Seekers Together in Manchester, the New Step for African Communities, and is a trustee of the Manchester City of Sog Sanctuary, and also still finds time to run a community or group called Her Story Salford, which brings together migrant women in Salford. And she's been organizing with Solidarity North North Borders, the community of resistance around this intersection of both women's rights, migrant justice, and climate and uh, really is a passionate believer and advocate in the power of self-organized communities to fight for change and we have to remember it's been that politics which has uh, shaped and changed and won those the the very victories that we sometimes celebrate over these last hundred years so over you over to you Tandrima. Thank you Asad for such a fantastic introduction and thank you to all the speakers who spoke before me you are such an inspiration and definitely to everybody who is uh, here to support us. And the support, uh, support means so much to us because it is for the cause of climate and migrant justice, which I believe are intricately linked. I represent the people in our network who are men and women displaced from their homes due to climate change. And together we seek justice. Whether you come from Niger, you come from Sudan, Zimbabwe, where the rivers have dried up, and the expanding desert is causing drought and famine, or if you're suffering in Bangladesh or Brazil due to deforestation and forest land being sold to rich builders with government contracts, or you're from the Middle East, we are all suffering the injustices of the same system. So yes, all of my work focuses on a just system that doesn't discriminate or bring hostility to further torment the vulnerable and traumatized of our world today. I'm a passionate believer of social justice and women's rights and being a campaigner and activist for both these causes. I believe that anti-migration laws impact women disproportionately and I firmly advocate climate justice as migrant justice. All the charities that I work along with, they provide a safe space for traumatized women and for men. And I'm part of a lot of research that is happening right now to change policies and uh, with various universities for women who are fleeing modern slavery or domestic abuse. So these charities all provide people with tools to skill themselves. They provide a space for people to spend their time enjoying um, things that they like to do or simply socializing. So you must remember that all of these are denied by the home office or by this government's current uh, hostile environment. The ask of integration seems to um, seems like a one-sided responsibility, you know, on the migrants, when this government is determined to keep us all out of this narrative that's actually about us, because they're making us villains here, while uh, denying our basic human rights, and that is going unchallenged mostly. And it's no surprise that inequality is at the heart of today's climate crisis. Since COP26, the richest 1% of the world's population have emitted much more carbon than the population of Africa does in an entire year. It is high time for the former colonial powers of the world to take responsibility for the climate emergency they have created. It is not accidental that the rich nations responsible for half of all historical CO2 emissions, the US, Germany, UK, France, Italy, Spain, Belgium, Netherlands, and 15 others who are also former colonial powers of the world. The main consequence of the European so-called industrial revolution was not only colonial conquest, but also the environmental calamities we witness today. Mass production of commodities, which required cheap labor and raw material, which enriched European nations, but impoverished their colonies. Wherever they went, the colonizers not only dismantled the sovereignty of nations, they modernized, quote unquote, but also depleted our natural resources. This sadly hasn't ended yet and continues till date under the guise of capitalist ideals of modernization. Yet they blame and shift responsibility on the poorer nations and the global south for any crisis, be it climate change or migration. So India, where I come from, is a former 
British colony and is blamed for its carbon, carbon emissions, which is famous. The country as a whole produced about 7% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions this year, roughly the same as the European Union and about half of the United States. But India has far more people than both these regions combined. It's much poorer with hundreds of millions of people lacking reliable access to electricity, which is a direct effect of hundreds of years of colonialism that left India poorer on all accounts. Today, with its high levels of poor population, it's still exploited with producing goods for the richer nations who get away with paying next to nothing. We also see how colonialism laid the foundation for both the climate crisis and also today's border regimes that exist across the world with richer white nations of the global north increasingly militarizing their borders to keep out those of us whose lands they colonize and whose backs they became rich by expatriating our land and enslaving our people. Modern border systems are designed to stop the people on whose backs the world's wealth has been built from accessing any of it. This is becoming even more stark as the climate catastrophe worsens. I'd like to remind everyone of the hostile environment and Britain's immigration and asylum systems um, to see how it looks like today and to remember that it is very important that uh, we always, always remember that these border systems are not broken or simply dysfunctional, but these are the hostile, uh, they have been made hostile and violent by their very design. Human beings who make treacherous journeys and risk everything to get to safety are being targeted for wanting to be safe. The whole system seems to work against keeping people safe. The laws are confusing, even to legal minds, the barrier of language, culture, and the rule, of course, for not letting people work or study. All of this beats the purpose of providing sanctuary. Granting sanctuary isn't a one-time thing, nor is it a one-size-fits-all model. The notion of sanctuary being a charity as opposed to the recognition of basic human rights begs debating. This will, I hope, um, help to challenge and change the narratives around migration. There's also the delays in deciding cases that impact people's access to services, not being able to work is one of them as well. While we wait for a decision, even though you might be qualified and your job might be listed in the shortage of occupation list, um, there are so many people who are being criminalized, they're exploited to make ends meet deliberately, uh, people are being kept in poverty and destitution, limiting ability to work or study, threatening people with detention, deportation, which cause irreparable damage to this community. My own daughter being one of them, she's still awaiting a decision after she graduated with honors in computer science from Glasgow University. It's very degrading to live in a state of limbo and being shunted without a purpose, uh, yet you're expected to follow rules and you're expected to integrate. So um, again, as Asad said, most of us are seeing what's happening with the barge situation now which in my opinion are just floating prisons at best. And this hostile environment, which is a sprawling web of immigration control that impact every aspect of our society and all the things that people need to live a dignified and flourishing life is definitely denied to them. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the mental and physical health requirement of migrants will already be anticipating the various complications arising out of this barge situation and these conditions. These systems are made to fail and they create chaos, which helps in building this government's populist sponsored narratives of blaming migrants for every fault and shortcoming of their own policies. So be it in healthcare, no access to education, bank accounts, you can't, I mean, you can't access a bank account, whether you can get married or not is challenged. You can't get a driving license, you can't rent a house. So these are just a few of the things. So all of these are not just words that I'm saying to you, but these are real life experiences of myself as well as the people um, who are in our communities and in our networks. And these, all of us are waiting for years for a chance to live a fair and decent life, a life of dignity. We are hoping that our misery isn't used against us 
but we keep seeing this negative rhetoric from the media, this government, who are constantly blaming migrants for these conditions which are not, which they are not responsible for. It's the big money players that hide behind these governments and shift the blame to the most vulnerable who don't have a voice, while the rich keep getting richer and the poor constantly stay poor. They create a divide in the society and fuel conflict. This keeps us divided and distracted while they build their empires. It's time to open our eyes, in my opinion, and confront the causes of racism that has been forced upon us. What we need is to come together to resist all aspects of these border controls and understand the global racial capitalist structures that produce borders, which includes the Global North's response to the climate crisis. We are now beyond pledges. We need action and accountability. We must demand better action plans and a timeline for this, for when this will be implemented. We don't want any more promises. We must keep questioning the implementation of the illegal migration bill that sees refugees as criminals. We must demand safe routes to be made available to everyone seeking sanctuary. Together, we must demand justice for people who are displaced by climate change, who are forced to migrate in search of food and shelter and ask for the government to stand by its commitments. It's time to come together for action and change, abolish all of those empty promises. So as Asad mentioned, I am part of the Solidary, um, Solidarity Knows No Borders community, and our community is one of resistance and care. And this is exactly what we are doing across Britain. Uh, we are uh, getting stronger by the day by organizing in migrant communities to build our power to bring about change. As a community, we organize and we strategize, we share resources to build collective campaigns and actions. We show up in solidarity with each other for both short-term and long-term change. Together, we believe we are strong. We work to deepen and expand grassroots organizing to share a platform with organizations, groups, communities around the country. We plan and coordinate actions of solidarity to reach more people. This is how we believe a powerful migrant justice movement can be built. The Solidarity Knows No Borders Network does not want to replicate or replace any work that is already ongoing, but instead we hope to link up the movement for migrant justice by bringing us all together as a community that respects and looks after each other to bring in meaningful change. Hope you all found this useful and I thank you for your patience. Thank you so much. Thank you and uh, uh, thank you to all of the speakers. I'm not going to uh, paraphrase any of them because I, I know the clock is ticking and I've been a very poor chair in that effect. Um, that we were going to show a slide uh, with lots of the links of how you can actually do some something positive. Uh, uh, that theme of resistance solidarity, which was through everybody's uh, uh, contributions. And I think, as we all know, and you probably heard it countless times, uh, solidarity is a verb and it's the most important word, I think, in the vocabulary of anybody who fights for justice. And so we're going to share that at the end, including also a video from Sheffield, which shows some real practical ways. Um, but I'm going to move swiftly to the uh to the q a because we had lots of amazing questions and and thank you to uh people who've answered questions as well so i'm going to ask uh, uh, uh i'll pick a, a two or three and just ask folks to uh respond to those as quick uh, very briefly um because the clock is ticking so we had a question about how to counter the greenwashing policies on climate action somebody was saying in their area in france they're cutting down parts of the forest to put solar farms destroying wetlands buying and renting agricultural land to big renewable companies um uh, uh we also had a, a a question and so maybe mel uh might want to uh, uh, touch on that we also had a question about how we can override or change the hierarchical structure of global northern systems uh to start action from the perspective of people and the people most deeply affected and 
and and that going back to what Nura and uh, and and Ravi uh, were saying really early on, uh, why is it important for climate campaigners to become careful in how they communicate about the intersection about climate migration, and what should we be communicating, and what should we be calling for, both at a global level in negotiations and 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 and, and of course uh, in our national context. Um, uh, uh, and there was also, I, I suppose, so many aspects to this, and this is why it's all going to be a part of a longer part of a conversation. But we also had a question about the the military machine, the militarized response to both climate and migration, and how important that is a factor. So we've got four questions. We'll go there. We'll see how far we get with those, um, and and if we can do another round. So I'm going to ask people to be brief. Don't try and answer all of them. Pick uh, one uh, uh, if you can. So I will go in the order that the speaker spoke. So over to you, Rav, first. Um, I think I can speak to uh, what we can say to people and how we can sort of reframe this. Um, I think in, in terms of the climate movement and, you know, being careful, um, we, we need to be really careful around um, feeding into sort of scare stories about migration. Um, you know, the climate movement um, has had had some bad moments with doing that. Um, sadly, David Attenborough, who's sort of one of our um, you know leading lights of the, of Britain, uh, has done that as well in some of his his Blue Planet Blue Planet documentaries. So that's one thing we need to make sure we don't do on the climate movement side. In terms of what we should be saying, we should be centering human stories. Uh, we should be rehumanizing people. You know, when we talk about migration, it's a lot about numbers. These aren't numbers. These are people. These are real people with families, uh, with communities, and we need to recenter them. So that's one thing we need to do. We need to be building coalitions. We need to be um, listening to people. Um, so, you know, from the from the migrants rights sector point of view, um, the, the media and the political class are continuously um, bombarding people with anti-migrant narratives. And, um, you know, life isn't easy for a lot of us. You know, there's a cost of living crisis and energy crisis bills are going up and the government keep positioning migrants as, as the people to blame. And, and after a while, this may sort of start to seep into people's minds. So we need to listen to them, but really understand what is it that they're upset about? Is it migration? Is it actually migration or is it the fact that they, they can't pay their bills? And, and, who, and who is the real enemy here? It's not migrants. We know that it's not people who move for a better life. It's, you know, big multi-billionaire co corporations. It's people that don't pay their taxes, the Amazons and the Googles. So we need to we need to refocus people on that. Um, I'm not going to take too long. I think I'll, I'll stop there because otherwise uh, I'll speak. Really. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, Mel. Uh, people feel free if they're like, I, those, I don't want to say anything. I'm just going to go in the order in which people spoke. Mel. Um, yeah, uh, I think I think Rav's made some like brilliant, brilliant points there. I mean, there, there are plenty of people in the climate movement who are um, very anti-migration. Um, and I think I think as as has been said, you know, we need we need a humanitarian um you know we, we when, when people move like it, we, we need to think about it not not in terms of law not in terms of like re necessarily like reinforcing um you know existing injustices but you know in terms of a humanitarian um response to to, to people on the move um i don't i don't know was i sorry um was I supposed to be answering a like, specific question? Or no, well, well, I, I wonder whether you have something thought, in terms of just as a climate activist about the whole greenwashing of climate action. You might feel fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of um, your know, power always finds a way of of kind of capturing you know a good thing and and uses language in an Orwellian way. Uh, so um, yeah, there was there was a question there about a bit of forest that is, is going to be developed and they're calling it climate action and they're putting um you know renewable energy on there and and renting out the land and, and you know it sounds like you're like wiping everything you know wiping everything off off that land so um yes that 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 is greenwashing calling it out as such like finding out you know who are the companies involved like who is profiting who is benefiting from that you know what what's what are the the um you know important species that that, that live on the land that are that are you know, going to be threatened, going to be um, 
eradicated from from that space and you know have it having a campaign and making that case directly to the public and, and calling it out as 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 greenwashing um i also just wanted to say briefly because i didn't i didn't say earlier that um you know when when i'm talking about marcus and i think you know when it, when anyone is talking about about marcus and and and, and climate defenders um you know it's really really Im important to kind of like bring um you know to kind of like think about the people on the on the front line of, of of climate breakdown and you know talk about it in that wider context so that we're always sort of broadening out the struggle and including um racialized communities that are you know experiencing um the effects of as, as other speakers uh, spoke about you know people that live near um environmentally polluting sites and and suffer the like the worst kind of health effects you know is, black child is killed by air pollution you know that's not that's not a coincidence black brown and indigenous communities suffer like the worst effects of 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 climate and ecological breakdown and so we need to be fighting alongside them they you know if it needs to be one movement because if we don't have that broad base we're not going to achieve our aims um yeah. So when, when, when we're talking about when we're talking about Marcus and Morgan, it's not it's not just you know it's not it's not just what's happening to Marcus as an individual struggle. People are being deported all the time. Um, wide widen it out. Make sure that we're always including like all the marginalised communities so that we actually have a chance of of, of winning this fight. Thank you, uh, Nura. Thank you. Um, yeah. If I may come up on the questions around the narratives. Um, I think it's very, very uh, important that um, we acknowledge that climate movement didn't always get it right. Sadly, we didn't. And some of us are still not getting it right. And I think it's really important to call it out. But this is an intersectional issue. This is not just a climate change issue. This is a migration and a humanitarian issue, um, which is why at Climate Outreach, we put a lot of emphasis on um, our language. When we develop narratives, I think that's why it's very important to make a distinction between climate linked displaced mobility movement versus climate linked migration, because the needs of those two groups are very different. For, for one of those groups, there needs to be a very immediate response from the humanitarian sector almost at the time that happens. Whereas for climate linked migration displacement, which happens mostly on the African continent and South Asia, where international border crossings does happen, but where most are local and domestic movements, they, their neighboring countries are still struggling financially and economically because of climate change and also because of the other inequalities and injustices that's existed. So, for, so therefore, when we speak about, especially in the UK, where reality is that there is no climate linked migration wave that's at our door or at our shores or our borders we need to move away from that narrative and we need to be speaking the reality that what's happening in african continent in the indian continent in the south asia which we've heard from the speakers and we need to be focusing on building narratives about fairness because we do research into narratives that resonates with the british public and from our research into narratives, we understand that fairness is a concept that a lot of people relate to. And if you frame the conversation around fairness, there is, there is more hope in being able to engage with people and being able to mobilize financial, financial aid and uh, development sector money into those countries where it's needed. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, over you to over to oops. Have we lost a, uh, did we lose uh, our last speaker? Oh, I think we might have. I think we might have. Did we lose? Yeah, sorry, T Tadrium has had to, had to run oh. off for a, a commitment. Sorry, oh, okay. I, had, I was like messaging you. Oh, so, so sorry. Sorry. Look, uh, 
uh, I'm really conscious now that 7.30 we did say it was one and a half hour and thank you to all of the uh, amazing people who stayed on there. We, we are going to send all of these links about how you build solidarity, how you can connect and support the many wonderful groups and campaigns that are working on, on these. Uh, we're going to share that with everybody, all the resources. We're going to share this amazing video also from Sheffield there. I think the real strong message you've heard from everybody, this is fight is not about reducing simply carbon it's about reducing injustice and the climate movement for too long had a very very narrow lens and uh, what really when we look at the 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 reality of these multiple crises climate inequality cost of living displacement to people we know that the answer to all of them is based on about solidarity and cooperation both at a national and, and at a global level and as Nura said the concept of, of fairness and that's why you know the fights that we're fighting um whether it's around the sharing of the commons of water and land and air and protecting those or ensuring that everybody has the right to be able to ha have energy and food that tackles inequality and gives people those uh, uh living wages and social protection those all those necessary things that now the climate scientists are telling is are not just simply important to address inequality but are critical to building the resilience of communities on the front line and addressing the climate crisis we know we're also faced with planetary limits and uh, this part story is one part of it in terms of the human story about the people of, of the that have the right not to move but also the right to move and the reality of what are the drivers uh, of these injustices. And they are the same drivers. And that's, you've heard the stories here. There are many, many different spaces and networks. We as War and Want talk about a global Green New Deal that connects all of these issues together. But what we know is none of this is possible unless we create these networks of care, support and solidarity. That's what the Climate Justice Coalition is, is trying to do, build our movement so that we're greater than the individual, some parts. Otherwise, we will lose each of these fights by ourselves. So it's important we make the connections that we win and fight together. Um, uh, the IPCC, when it released its report last year, said change is now inevitable. The only question is what kind of change. It's up to all of us to make sure that that change is something towards a fairer, more equal and just and safer world for everybody and not the change that they want to see, which will create even deeper inequalities, injustices, deeper racial injustice, patriarchal and, and migrant injustice. We have a lot to win. We have a lot to fight. Um, but I will end, as I always usually do, with my favourite quote from the architect of neoliberalism, who said that the goal of Evie's ad advocates and acolytes was to keep uh, the ideas and policies alive until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. And that's what we have to do. We have to keep hope and uh, uh, hope alive. And together, I'm sure... Uh, we can change both the dynamics here in the UK as well as uh, at the global level. So thank you to everybody. Thank you to all the amazing CJC and everybody team behind, to JCWI, to migrants organised, to the War on Want crew as well, and to all of you who've made the time to join us here, to whether you're listening on Facebook, we will send out all of these resources. Um, so please don't be passive, be active, join, and together we have a future to fight for. Thank you. The world we want to see is a world where there is justice, where everybody has dignity, people enjoy their human rights because they are human beings, a world where solidarity is part of the way people live. We are communal human beings, social human beings. We need to work alongside other people, get ideas, work together so that uh, we achieve uh, whatever we aim to do. And quite a lot of our uh, successes have been uh, gained by working together. We can push forward and bring about effective change. Our main message is join the union and take ownership of your fights because we want to be there with you, supporting you. And hopefully through these communities of resistance, we can build bigger support and mutual and reciprocal support. The immigration system has been designed to be hostile. So people have problems in education, in accessing housing. Uh, they live in, you know, poor, rundown housing. And also, um, they basically cannot live their lives and their rights are taken away. If your immediate emergency is your climate emergency, join up with people fighting the climate emergency. But don't forget the migrant. Don't forget the struggling nurse. Don't forget your neighbour next door. It's building work, but with a belief that it can be better. It's a 
societal winds are pushing us towards being broken and being shut off and being siloed and therefore fearing the other. So making sure that we challenge that, not just by doing the actual work of changing the system, but by coming together and living what it truly means to be in community together and in solidarity with each other is absolutely crucial and it will give us that energy and that joy we need to do the work we need to do. Coming together right now to build a migrant justice movement is crucial. We need to come together. Humanity is about hope, and hope is with us and will always be with us. Communities don't want to be divided. Neighbors don't want to be divided. You can take action with us by challenging the, the hostile environment. Check us out, Solidarity Knows No Borders, and sign up and join the movement for, for migrant justice. Thank you again to all of our panel speakers and to all of you for sticking around for those last slides.